Hi guys, and welcome back to Kit Car Direct and NK Sports Cars. Well, we're in for an IVA special edition on this video. We're going to talk about the car and give you like 60 top tips of putting your car in preparation for IVA. Now, it's a big scary thing that everybody seems to make a big deal about this, put it through IVA, but I can trust you, we put plenty of these through and the guys at the IVA VOSA centres always, basically there to help you, always. They're very helpful, you speak to them politely, you treat them with respect, hey, wanna get your car passed? They're only there looking after your safety. The way I look at it is, if you've got a daily driver, not like this, got a Land Rover, a Renault, or any other brand of vehicle, you probably take it to an MOT yearly. You don't know if it's gonna pass, it may have a gator under there that spit. And we kind of accept that, but with IVA, because you built it and someone's picking apart your precious, I suppose, pride and joy like this one, you get a little bit concerned. But don't be guys, don't fret, we're gonna give you a top 60 top tips to helping you get your car through its IVA pass. If you like what you see and you're into your kit cars, guys, then um, why not subscribe to our channel? Press subscribe, click on the bell icon, press all, and it sends you notifications each week. Right, so let's get into this, into the car, and we're going to start at the front end of the vehicle here. You will need your trusty tape measure for this, but generally, you may have an MK, an MK Indy like this, and in the build menu, it does give you all the measurements and guides to doing it but if you're building another brand then you may not have so much privilege to such information I don't know they're different their manuals and their cars may be slightly different so we're going to talk about this is basically based on the M1 manual now this is all downloadable you can go on the VOSA website and you can download the M1 manual if you're not if you've got any concerns or etc so let's get into the front end here so we've got things like indicators lights sharp edges so we'll talk through these first so I have got a trusty clipboard here because there's 60 items to get through so apologies for that but Indicators, there is a minimum height and distance that these need to be from this outside edge. So, what have we got here on the indicators? We have a minimum height, 350 mil. We are at 400 on this one, and it's 400 from the edge. And we are at here, 340. So you've just got to make sure it's within that realms. So, minimum of 350, you can go up to a meter, you can go all the way up here if you want to, chaps. It's not a problem. Um, and you can go further in, but you cannot. So realistically, 400 and 350 is your minimum, and that's where you need to set them at. Okay, next on the, uh, on the list, headlights. Now, these also have, again, a minimum distance. So you have minimum from edge, which is same as the um, indicators here, which is 400 to the, to the um, edge of the light here. So we were at 360 to the headlight and they have a where is it minimum height of 500 we're at uh, 560 here so they can go up as high as uh, I think it's 1500 actually or is it 1200 1200 and go up as high as here right up here if you want to not a problem at all but making sure but the second there's a couple other things of headlights they do a 45 degree angle test so this beam can't interfere directly at 45 degree angle from that lens with anything else. So if you're taking it from here and you're standing 45 degree to the lens, looking across, if the camera comes behind me, you'll see, looking in, you need to see from that angle, this lens on this side and on this side. You don't need two of it, all of it, but you need to see this lens from that angle. Whoops, knocked the headlight. Um, so yeah, that's one impact. And obviously you must make sure that the beam has got a Marking on it, an e-marking as well. These need to be e-marked because some of the LED patterns, they will look up for a kick-up beam. Some of the LED headlights have a flat beam and that's also acceptable as well. Something else on the indicators here, we have the ones here with measurement, but we also have this little one on the side of the wing here. Now this is called the five degree angle test from the rear of the vehicle. You need to be able to stand here at five degrees from the vehicle to be able to see that corner indicator illuminating we'll get it illuminated now to give you an idea so that's that small indicator that cannot be fitted in this section here which some people have done in the past it has to be fitted on the front wing so it can be visualed 
from five degrees. Same as these indicators, they have to be at the front of the vehicle. You cannot set them back here because they will look from this corner and if it's under here and you cannot see it from the corner over there, then this will be a foul. So the indicators must be at the front of the vehicle so you can see it from 45 degrees, same as the headlights. Right, I think we'll look at the sharp edges now, guys. Um, front end of the vehicle. The Ivy tester has a 100 mil sphere. I don't have one, unfortunately, but I can make a good fist. And that gives you a really good guide of what to look into. So if I can touch my big fist, so to speak, onto anything that's at edge, it needs to be covered. If it's more than 2.5 mil radius, that's fine. If it's less, then these little, fr these little things here, your little covers, or your friend, cover it up or you've got U-trim. So the mud guards here, if that was, wasn't on there, that's got a sharp edge, this U-trim, perfect for that. And it has to be something that's permanently fixed, not stick on foam, etc. So cover every sharp edge. If you can get your fist in there and push it in and touch it, even this bolt here, that would need a cable tie around it. We've got one here, I can move it across. That goes over it and covers it, that's fine. But if I can get in there and touch that, then it classes a 2.5 mil radius. So I can't touch the knuckle in there with my fist, nope. So that's fine, it doesn't need an edge on it or uh, smoothing over. I can't get into there and touch that. If I can get this bit in, I can't get the fist in there, can't touch it. These are covers for the steering rack. I can't pull that off completely, but we'll give it a try. There we go. This knuckle here, if that wasn't covered, it's a 2.5 rear. So that would be a foul. So that's why these covers go over them to protect them. And uh, once that's over in that location, that will cover that over. And it's the same on both sides. All the front end in this area, mud guards, wishbones, ball joints. I can't get into there with my fists, so it doesn't need a cover on it. Um, these indicator extensions, and then all your front grill and mesh. We've put a mesh over this one, because our grill underneath would have a sharp edge. So we put a nice mesh over it. Of course, touching that now, there's no sharp edges. And that applies even if you've got a bonnet scoop. Just making sure the ratio says here. I can't get my fist into that bit there, so it doesn't actually need you trim there, but that's there just to neaten the edge up, but that doesn't matter. Make sure the panels are flush fit here. That's got an edge, and you can touch it with your fist and it's got a radius, then you need to move that across. Right, as you can see, we don't actually have a number plate bracket on here. We do sell one, but if you did put the number plate aluminium bracket there and it's got a sharp edge, you would need to rubber trim that, but it's not a requirement for IV8. You do not need a number plate bracket on there for that. You'll need one on the rear, and we'll explain it in a minute. So you can leave that completely blank. Okay, I'm going to move on to the front wings here. We spoke about the trim around the wing. We spoke about the indicator here. And uh, we're going to talk about coverage, how much the wing needs to cover. So we take a vertical line through here using my trusty tape measure. This needs to be 30 degrees coverage. If you have the wing finishing there, that will be a foul. It needs to be there and there, coverage of a minimum of 30 degrees. And also, if you're putting a straight edge down here, that the tire is not on the outside of the rim. So there's, I can clearly get my finger there between the two. If I put the tape measure up, there's a gap between there and the edge of the tire on, not so much the inside, but on the outside edge here. This needs to be clear, because that's the widest part of the vehicle, the widest part of the edge here obviously spray or water or debris coming up. So just making sure that they clear 30 degrees from the center line of the wheel and that it covers the entire tire and the outside sidewall. Braided hoses next. We're gonna move in. Most of the seven style vehicles have these braided hoses in, which allow the vehicle and steering to move. And they will look to put the steering on lock to lock to make sure that when they move from lock to lock, that there is no interference they'll hit in onto like this, a metal component. So you need to make sure you angle these in such a way you can loosen and tighten them, adjust them accordingly, so that when you go full lock to lock, that there is no interference with any of the body or mechanical components. Obviously that would be a foul if it did, so that's why we make these angled lenses and adjustables inside here so you can twist the cable accordingly. These also have to have markings on them to say that they are compatible for brake fluid. So it's got a little dot for in here that tells you that it's compatible with a label and a tag. Okay, still focusing on the front end here. Under here is the headlight adjuster. Once you've adjusted your headlight for your beam pattern, um, they will generally allow you to bring a spanner and make an adjustment on the day because these tend to have a slight bit of movement in them. 
make sure that there's a big rubber cover to cover up any sharp edges on this it and that the wires are nice and secure because if they go through here on the body panel and they didn't have any anything to protect it from chafing the wires every panel that you do you've got to make sure there's something where it can't chafe through the wire so that cover will then go back up the side and you can tighten it up and set your beam pattern accordingly right while we're down on here on the side of the vehicle two important things here bonnet catches two of them which secure our bonnet down obviously it's very important don't want this coming off these ones that we supply are rubber and they are IVA compatible because they are don't have any sharp edges if you go aftermarket and you're going from maybe a metal type of catch um, then you would have to make some kind of cover that would probably cover it because it may not comply with a 2.5 mil radius test because it again if you can touch it with your fist and it doesn't have a 2.5 mil radius edge then it would need some kind of covering which is permanent not sticky foam a permanent cover to cover over but you know fail safe is these come in our kits anyway they're a nice simple you know design that uh, complies with IVA right exhaust system time while we're down here as you can see this one has a cat in here we've probably put the heat protection on here so that maybe um, make somebody doesn't scorch themselves that is not a requirement for IVA it can be as hot as you like it makes no difference but what does matter again is the, is the radius test so if you've got the bracket please ensure that you tighten it up and it's tucked up out of the way either to this side or not because when they do the cone test we have this big large cone that comes down at an angle that leads to a floor level test then anything we see in that area which is your exhaust tip here needs to have a 2.5 mil radius it cannot have just a sharp edge the bracketry you can't touch it then it's fine if you can make sure there's a cover over the nut cover here and also the hole that it comes out of the panel if it's got a sharp edge please ensure it's got trimmed accordingly as well you don't need the heat wrap we do it just a bit of protection there really one in it so somebody isn't going to touch it because it gets very hot but i say you can have anything to do with that that's fine but noise test while we're here so the noise requirement on an exhaust system is at three quarters of your maximum rpm brake horsepower and they do it at 500 mil to 45 degrees from here and that needs to be 99 decibels so some phone apps can work and give you an indication but you know speak to maybe your exhaust supplier or manufacturer or your engine if you speak to us about that and you're not confident but they will do a test that comes out for a machine here at 45 degrees at 500 mil which is about here um, and angled off from the lows they put the meter in and it'll be three quarters of your maximum brake horsepower rpm so that's 99 decibels Okay, let's dive into the engine bay now, guys, and have a look under here. Lots going on. Obviously, the main component is the big power plant that's under here. But there's lots of other things you have to look out for. Um, so, one being, you'll have, obviously, fuel lines that will be running up to your throttle body, etc. Um, we always cover ours. These are under, down under here, tucked under and run under. We always cover ours in a split-type conduit. Um, but these have to be secured at maximum every 300 millimetres. So making sure you're within that. We say keep it every 200, you're well in compliance then, but maximum is 300 if you don't have the space to do it every 200. But keeping that in there and that they're on conduit. And you must ensure that you're not running them and clamped to electrical cables as well. Obviously it'd be a bit of a silly thing to do anyway, but um, you want to make sure that no electrical cables and fuel lines are running together in the same conduit because if you give an electrical problem that could be catastrophic for the vehicle but you know not just an IVA failure but more importantly to your pride and joy um, so securing those securing all the electrics as well every 300 millimeters maximum make sure they're tied p-clipped in split conduits there's no chafing of any wires that could then cause obviously complications for your vehicle but also it'd be an IVA foul if it's going to be chafing so things like that Throttle cables are not as important. They obviously making sure it's got a stop link and it's clean and it's nice and smooth in operation. Um, we've got brake fluid pots down in here. These need to have um, a low level warning indicator on them that comes up and links to your dashboard. So if you do have a brake leak or a brake fail in some kind of way and the fluid runs out, it will then give you a warning light um, on your dashboard. Um, generally, it's linked into your handbrake. Uh, mechanism under the same warning light as well but ensure that they're in there making sure all your brake pipes are secured again every 300 millimeters maximum we say 200 again um, keeping sure making sure they're p-clipped and they're not going to be running along any of the chassis that will allow chafing 
pretty common practice and I'm sure your standards of your vehicle will be high, but making sure it follows a nice clean directional line as well, that will make it nice and safe and secure for future. You know, we're talking about not one year or two years to the entire vehicle's age probably the brake lights will be in there so making sure that they're secured p-clips or rubber clips in place every so i would say 200 you're allowed 300 maximum steering column the link bar here this needs to be a collapsible or a 10 degree angle with a universal joint as a minimum that runs down from the steering rack down at the front of the vehicle up through and we have a universal joint under here on ours it runs up through the column as well and onto the steering wheel now this boss is a collapsible steering boss as well which is compliant and if you run in a quick release boss which you are allowed to do you still need a collapsible column and there mustn't be any play in the boss or steering and they will check that it'll be on the ramps and they'll put it onto the plates and they'll make sure that the steering is nice and smooth from lock to lock as well and there's no interference or anything in the steering column attach you know touching the link bar anyway or in interfering the steering in any way shape or form so making sure that's nice and secure and it's safe and it's not moving and you haven't bought a really cheap chinese steering wheel boss you've got to have a quality boss but there's no play in that in any way shape or form and a quick release boss can be used so don't be concerned about that but you must ensure that there's a collapsible part to it in the column as well Right, onto the engine section itself. So the engine, I'm sure you would have had it running and up to temperatures and bled all your coolant system and making sure it's functioning nice and healthily. Um, but obviously, once you've done that, check, make sure there isn't the odd water leak or oil leak. Everything's brand new, so going through the hoses, making sure all the Jubilee clips are nice and tight once you've heated it up and it's gone through its heat cycles. You don't want to get there on the day and there'll be coolant leaking or oil leaking in an unsuspected area that you haven't seen. So make sure you do a, a full few times heat and cool down tests on the vehicle engine um, and then double check and tighten up all your jubilee clips all for your lines oil lines etc make sure there's no leaks for the day you don't want to get there and have a small thing that will halt and stall your day for no particular reason battery is next we have a nice secure cover on ours the battery has to be secure it can't just pull out and secondly the positive terminal which would be here on ours if you haven't have a nice cover like this and you've got a, maybe a small race battery, you've got to make sure that the positive terminal is covered with some kind of cover that you can't contact with, with a tool or metal implement or if you had an aluminium skin bonnet that you could put on and it would interfere with that and earth out. So make sure the terminal is covered and it's nice and secure in its location. Chassis plate is next. Here we've got house marked up. I will cover it up, but basically needs to have the company name and the number and it must be in a rectangular box detailed for the chassis number here and it must be on this side the driver's side of the vehicle as long with the chassis number which should be etched into your chassis it's uh, either stamped or we etch ours in with a machine stepped in there and it must be also on this side of the vehicle which is the driver's side or off side as it will be called right while we talked about the chassis plate as identification Final thing for stickers down in the engine bay is this little sticker here, down by your fluid reservoir. So it has to be within 150 mil of your fluid reservoir, which is a little dot four sticker logo that tells you what you're putting into your vehicle. Right, emissions time, let's get into that. And it will vary depending on your engine age. And you will need to prove the engine age or it will come under the current emissions test, um, which is uh, CO2, hydrocarbons, H2O, and uh, Lambda sensor. So if you've got a pre-92 car and it's pre-catalytic converter, you need to prove it. If not, it will come under that current regulations. So on the day, they're gonna test it for you. If you're onto a CAT test, this has got a CAT in. Two things you need to do. One, ensure the engine is up to temperature before they test it, and they will allow you to do that. It needs to be up to at least 85 degrees as a recommendation, I would always try and get it hotter, get the fan kicking in, and make sure your oil is nice and up to temperature as well, as that will affect the uh, hydrocarbons as well. So making sure you've got clean engine oil in there, it's refresh, up to temperature, and then making sure that the cat will be ignited. So before you run it in, make sure you've warmed up the engine, get there nice and early at the test center, warm the engine up, and when you go and do your emissions test, hold it at a decent RPM, because they will test you between two and a half and 3,000 RPM, 
generally about 26 to 2800 is the, the guide once they put their on it and then making sure the cat is ignited and nice and hot. So I would hold it there for a good 20, 30 seconds, making sure the engine is right up to temperature and the cat is ignited to allow you to get that done. Obviously you'll probably do these pre-checks beforehand and you may have gone to a local MOT station or spoken to your manufacturer about it. Um, it, it depends on whether you've got a bike engine, car engine, early engine could have a cross flow. The Mazda engines come under the current, so it's, it's fine as long as you're running that without omics management, it's plug and play, it's up to the horsepower and it will automatically do it. But if you haven't and you're going down your own route, then obviously you say, look, speak to your local MOT testing station and make sure you maybe check it before you go to the IVA test. We'll move into the interior now, guys. Um, dashboards, steering column, as we spoke about this earlier, being collapsible on the column here. It's also for your safety. But um, dashboard, making sure if you've got 127 mil from your steering wheel, any, any direction from here, that everything is smooth it doesn't again the 2.5 mil radius test making sure there's nothing here that you can touch that has a sharp edge doesn't matter what in this area but within 127 mil of of the outside of the steering wheel then it would need to be all through the center tunnel so making sure there's no sharp edges on your handbrake lever or the trim etc here under the dashboard the dashboard must be radius this has a 19 mil radius our ones can comply automatically your manufacturers may not i don't know or you may be making your home build uh, dashboard, you want to make sure it's got a nice radius edge that goes under and away from the vehicle. And then once you're under the dashboard, if you can get your hand under here, which you can on this vehicle, making sure again that there is no sharp edges. If you need to, if you've got an alley panel under there, you need to trim the edge, making sure all the wiring is secure under the dashboard. There's nothing hanging down or relays loose, etc. Make sure it's all nice and secure under the dash and anything that's sharp or implement, again, if you could hit it with your knee, so to speak, in an incident, you've got to make sure it's covered and it has a 2.5 mil radius. Right, wing mirrors and center mirror. So they will do a test on these, making sure that they are 70 by 110 minimum size is A, that's one thing. Making sure, again, doesn't have any sharp edges. Some of the race mirrors that are out there have got a very sharp edge and they may not be in the size. So it's 70 by 110, but also, Centre mirror is required for visual. Um, if you've got a centre mirror, you actually don't need this outside measure, mirror if it will actually see the field of vision test, but we tend to put them on, it balances the car to give you a nice field of vision. Again, the centre mirror has to be in a vehicle and doesn't vibrate, must be a secure fixing. Again, no sharp edges, 2.5 mil radius on this as well um, for that. Secondly, they will test for looking for the vehicle to rear. You will sit into the vehicle, Mark a line here where your shoulder is on the floor. If you come out of your vehicle and stand in that section and pace 10 metres back directly from the vehicle and two and a half metres out, and you need to be able to see that mark through this mirror whilst you're sitting in the vehicle. So you'll pace 10 metres out and then two and a half metres out, mark a line, and if you can see that with our interference of the rear wing etc you can see these mirrors on stalks quite high up and then got to make sure that it complies with that field of vision and that you can also see through and there's no obstructions um, of, the, of the rear of the vehicle from this mirror also okay i'm going to move into this area we've got the dash all lit up i'm going to move into the the lights and switches location um, first thing is turn ignition off hazard light making sure the hazard light works without the ignition on. Some people wire them up with only ignition on, it would be a foul, it has to work without it. With the ignition on, we'll show you this, you must have markings for all of your switches. So on here we're using a standard measure, so it tells us it's side lights and dip beanies operational, so it's easy. But if you're using standalone switches, make sure they've got a symbol and that you have a warning light that lights up to tell you that it's on, that you need something to tell you that it's on. And especially with high beam, as you see, you've got a high beam warning light that hits on the dashboard, off and on, off and on, and also flash. Okay, so fog light time. Side lights, dip beam, fog light is now on and also has a symbol here to tell me that's on and it should be on the vehicle, lit up at the back. And what you must be able to do is turn the lights off and turn them back on again and the fog light is off. Going back to side lights, 
and it's off. I think Mary to be able to turn it on again and off. But if you turn the lights off and you turn them on again and it stays on, that would be a foul. So you must ensure we do a specific module for that, that when you turn it on and then off again and on, that it stays off and on. Okay, we'll talk about security really. For the test, you need two forms of immobilization on the vehicle. We have it on this one as standard, that we have a steering lock and a key. So that is two forms, and if you put this on, and it has to be automated, so that that will go on and off. Now, if you have a solid column and you don't have a steering lock, then you would need a key and a immobiliser that is automatic. It cannot be a battery kill switch or something that removable steering wheel. People think that taking the steering wheel off is a security device. It's not. It's classed as not automated. It has to be something that would automatically happen upon you leaving the vehicle. So, for example, as I've said here, if you've got the steering off and you lock it, somebody try to turn the wheel, it automatically comes on. Same as the immobiliser, you need to, to activate after X, Y, Z time that you've turned the ignition off and that you cannot then start the vehicle. That could be wired to the ignition, to the fuel pump, etc. But that's also security for your vehicle. Okay, brakes and uh, pedal box. Obviously, I'm not in the shop, but you can see we've got a billet pedal box here, which is bias adjustable. If you have a bias bar there, it needs to be pinned and secured in location. Nylocks are acceptable, which you can see once you've secured it in location, you have your bias set, you must set it and secure it. You cannot put a adjustable uh, item on the dashboard for you to be able to adjust it. You can do that on race days or afterwards, etc., but not for IVA. It must be pinned or secured. Don't need to weld it or anything like that. Pinned, you can drill and pin it, or nylock it is acceptable. And also, there needs to be a sticker within that area that reads about non-adjustment of the vehicle, and we supply these stickers and available. Right, while we're in this section of the dashboard here and the interior panelling, the handbrake efficiency needs to be tested. Make sure that there's plenty of handbrake and you've got some auxiliary. So if you're going up three to five clicks, making sure there's a bit of adjustment after that to be able to pull in and it's sufficient, you know, it's sufficiently working and operational. Now you may need to bed the brakes in a little bit prior to having everything that's brand new when you do your test. And again, sometimes they'll allow you a little adjustment on, on the day if there is time permitting. Um, you can work with the guys down there. But also we have ours wired in so that it tells you there's a warning light that the handbrake is on on the dashboard. Seats and seat belts next. In this area we sell a nice fiberglass lightweight seat. It does unfortunately have a sharper edge around the perimeter here which you can see we put a nice rubber trim to cover up the radius on both the harness holes and the edge of the seat. That makes it a permanent fixing so it makes it nice and secure and making sure that the seat belts are coming through the centre of the holes and this fixing point is nice and clear so that when you're sitting in with your shoulders that it's pulling down onto you. Trim right the way through, doesn't need to be adjustable but if you're putting in say a padded seat and it has a separate headrest, you can't have that on adjustment. If the headrest is fixed to the roll bar, the seat can't be adjustable away from it. The headrest has to be attached to the seat and move with it. So you can have a permanent fixed seat and a headrest bolted to there, that's absolutely fine. But if you have a headrest and it's separate and you have an adjustable seat, it must be part of the same seat. When you move to the back here where you secure the harnesses, they, so most of these have a sharp edge around them. You need to trim this or have a cover to go over it. We've got a nut cover and some trim around ours. That's fine. That complies again, like we said earlier, chaps, about the fist and touching it with the 2.5 mil radius. Seat belts in operation, they must have a marking on them to tell them it is. So if you've gone into eBay and found some, I don't know, cheaper ones, they've got to make sure that they've got a nice E marking on them and they're also that they work in one hand operation. You can't have to fiddle around. So you get this type or you get the two, the three, you, know, you call them the four point, these ones, but you get the three points as well with a red quick release buckle, which is also a one handed. We do them on a two inch harnesses as well, but it must be operational with one hand and a quick release buckle that returns to where it needs to be. So if it doesn't return to where it needs to be afterwards, it will probably foul. Okay, so last thing, overall in the interior here, making sure if you've got your fist again, that you're touching everything, that making sure there is no sharp edges. For example, on the back panel here, 
we've got a boot cover that covers that edge. But if that boot cover wasn't there, you can see we've got a sharp edge. That would need trimming, that would foul if you had a sharp edge on this section here. Our boot cover does come over to that section there and covers it, so it complies. So doing the whole area under the dashboard, the sides, the fronts, the seats, the interior, making sure if you didn't have a handbrake gaiter and it was a sharp handbrake lever, then of course that would foul. So a gaiter over there, gear gaiter, handbrake gaiter, covering all of those. Nothing within this, as I said, 127 mil radius for the steering wheel on the outside, that doesn't comply. So these doesn't, the dashboards that are behind them, but also, if you take your speedo, if you've got a digital speedo, the one thing it must do is when you turn it off and turn it on again, it defaults automatically once it's started up to a speedo setting. Okay, speedo can't be something you press and go through to find it. It must be automatically available. On our LED rear lights that we have here, these have a built-in reflector. But if you have a individual light set, and they don't have reflectors in, you will need a reflector on the vehicle in a location. The minimum height for that is 250 mil, which is down here. And the maximum height, I do believe, is something like 900 up here. So you can put it as high as that. And again, 400 from the edge is the maximum for your rear reflector. We have ours all built in. It's a nicely compact unit on an LED. And the these lights as well must also, when you're standing at five degrees from the vehicle, must be able to see both lights from the rear of the vehicle. It can't be inset. So I'm standing five degrees from the vehicle. I must be able to see this light over here. And if it's an LED light, making sure it's nice and reflective and you can still see it from that angle. We'll move on to the fog light here. So we have an LED fog light. This again has a minimum height, a bit like the reflector. 250 mil is the minimum. So if you have your fog light tucked under here, you will probably fail because it's under the 250 mil. It would be something like 200. So ours is up here, it's 400. And that can go as high as I do, but it's a meter. So you can come up to a meter also. But there must be also a minimum separation between your tail light and your fog light of 100 mil which you can see here, we are 140 mil. So that's a minimum separation of a 100 mil, 250 from the floor and up to a meter high. And the fog light must have a marking on it as well, an E or an F marking on it. Just on the fog lights, this is a different version of the fog light. Again, we spoke about the 2.5 mil radius edge. If you've got a fog light like the standard ones, these have a sharp edge here. Gotta make sure there's some kind of rubber trim. We use a small P-trim put into there to section it and also on the standard rear light pack if you're using the clear lenses obviously these reflectors are built in but if you was using a round light a round light as we're showing here then you need a separate reflector as shown in the image there reverse light that doesn't actually have a requirement where it needs to be but generally I would say put it in a similar position to your fog light because it balances the light pack on the rear same as the number plate light that doesn't need a set height or location that can go underneath as well but you must ensure you have sufficient space in here to put in a number plate of standard size so if it's this location you can see here we've allowed about uh, 150 mil to get a number plate in here and plenty of width to fit it in there the last thing on the fog light is making sure that this is vertical to the road and parallel from 90 degrees up. So this has got the field of vision spreading out. The lights don't need it. They need to be obviously well field of vision. If it's pointing up, it's gonna foul. But if it's nice and clear and visible from the rear of the vehicle. We'll move on to the fuel cap there. While we're in the fuel cap, removing the fuel cap. Now we haven't got a tether on this one because you cannot remove the key without turning the lock and taking it out. So that's a compliant. If you can take the fuel cap out and remove the key at the same time, that can go out, you will need a tether for this, for the fuel cap inside there, and it mustn't fall off. So that's compliant. One of our fuel caps, it locks in place, and you take it out, and basically you can shake it, and it won't come off. That's compliant. If it does do that, you'll need a tether kit to secure the cap. So if you drove off from the fuel station, your cap will still be secure to your vehicle. On the rear of the vehicle, same as the front, we have a braided brake line that allows suspension to move up and down. This again needs to be sort of floating in, 
its own space that when the suspension travels up and down, it's not interfering with any mechanical component which could cause chafing. And again, must have a marking on it, like a little sticker here to say it's dock bore compatible. Same as all the lines that go through, if you're using a copper or copper nickel or any kind of um, rubber hose line, it must show that it's compatible for dock floor fluid. Okay, we're going to talk about some tyres now. Now, tyres have a spe <laughs> very sus specific job, I suppose, in terms of safety as well as performance. Um, there's a couple of things to look out for. Make sure you, when your tyres are fitted, if it has outside or side outwards sticker, that must be on the outside, or it may have a rotational arrow on here, an arrow for direction as well. Um, they must be speed rated as well to your vehicle. So whatever speed limit you've set your vehicle to, if it be a H, a Y, or etc. Rating, making sure that complies with your vehicle, and make sure they're in good condition. If it's up more than sort of 10 years old, most tires have a date stamp, it's probably going to be very hard and brittle and maybe not compliant, um, and they are date coded here, then they may check that to make sure it's compliant within that year of manufacture as well. So anything over 10 years old, probably you wouldn't be putting your vehicle anyway because it would probably be brittle, but they may check this as well. Right, we're going to talk about, I'm sitting in the vehicle here, self centre test. Um, you will need a bit of an open space to test this, but your manufacturers hopefully, if the vehicle's set up right and the geometry's right, the tracking's correct, the tow, uh, the camber of the wheels have been done and the tyre pressures are set at your specified uh, tyre pressure for your brand of tyre, they will take it to an open space in the IVA test centre. They have a large circular area and they will put the vehicle onto full lock, like so, and then take the hands off the wheel and accelerate around in the circle. And then the vehicle must show effort to start to rotate and back to centre. Um, they won't do it all the way around, they'll maybe do a couple of loops and accelerate off, etc. as well. On your daily driver, you probably notice it as you've come out of a junction, you let go of the wheel slightly so the steering wheel feeds back into it. This is the same thing, it complies with that. That is the self centre test. Right, while you're out in the vehicle, if you've managed to find a secure place to do the self centre test, etc you may want to do an acceleration test and make sure that your front brakes are locking before the rear brakes if you've got a bias adjustable pedal box obviously that will be adjustable so you may have put it in directly onto the rear master cylinder rather than the front if you've got a standard master cylinder that's probably already preset in there for you but you can go along accelerate it to a reasonable speed in a safe environment and make sure that you pressing the brake pedal nice and firm and you see the front wheels lock up before the rear. We spoke about the front tyres a section ago, same with the rears, making sure the outside face is that and there'll probably be a matching pair or you may have staggered um, 205s and 185s, but also making sure the same as the front test at the 30 degree angle that it covers the tyre and also that it's pulling the straight edge down that this tyre does not protrude outside the rear arch here, which this one doesn't, of course, um, but if you had a wheel offset and the tyre was out here, that would be a foul. So it's got to make sure it's compliant, it's under there, and compliant with the 30 degree coverage of the tyre. While you're in this area, making sure that if you have got aftermarket arches, that this has got a nice, again, the 2.5 mil radius test chaps, the examiner will run his hand all the way over the vehicle to make sure there's no sharp edges out of this, all the way to the front, and to the rear of the vehicle here, making sure there's compliance on the 2.5 all the way around, under the rear of the panel, um, and anything that's under the floor line area where it would impact on a body component. Okay, while you found this space to do your self-centre test and your brake check, one thing to also check is your speedo calibration. Now, if you've got a digital dashboard or a speedo that's allowed you to type in those parameters, it's a good chance to check that, maybe against a GPS, sat nav, or et cetera, to make sure it's within that speed limit up to that 70 mile an hour maximum, um, and to make sure that it's not um, out of the realms of that. Now, one thing I will say is, if it's on the front wheel, and they cannot check it, because they check, all the speedo is checked from the rear of the vehicle. If you put it onto a front wheel, they will ask you to prove and ask documentation to prove that the speedo is calibrated. So my advice would be make sure it's on the prop shaft or any of the rear drive train to make sure that they can then test it on the day. I'm gonna dive into the rear now, guys. Um, fuel tank needs to be very secure in location and also have an earth strap from here to the chassis. The fuel filler neck has to be fuel compliant 
Um, if it hasn't got a mark in, they may ask for documentation to prove that it is um, fuel sufficient. Secondly is all the wiring again in these locations is secured. As you can see, we've got them here in saddle bushes. We've, been, we've got 200 here, but we've been the 300, and that nothing is gonna fall off. The brake lines are nice and secure. Any rubber fuel lines that we've got here, you can see they're all in split conduit and covered as well, all the way down and through the chassis here. All the fuel lines are in split conduit and covered and protected. And you can see here, like I said a second ago, the speedo drive is picking up off the rear drive shaft on this particular vehicle. Final thing on the fuel tank is this. It's a breather, but tip over sensor. So the vehicle did unfortunately end up on its roof that then there's a little bearing in here that would shut off so that fuel would not be spilling out of the vehicle. Just as a general observation, when you're in your vehicle and you're building it, you've got certain things that are moving very fast, drive shafts here, etc., and your prop shaft that goes into your diff, making sure that there's no cables, fuel lines, or electrical wires that may interfere with those or come into contact that cause cause obviously a hazard. So and the, the general construction in here is neat and tidy and everything is nice and secure. It's not gonna come rattle free, but you've got two mo three moving components in there, wheels as well, making sure that any of the lines that run into them that we, or cables that run through, that none of those are interfering with those moving components. Windscreen and aero screen guys, you can see that we haven't got anything fitted here on this particular vehicle, mainly for the field of vision test. Uh, if you're going for a screen or a windscreen, you would then need wipers, um, washing facilities and screen wiper rotation and also a demist facility if you're fitting that as standard. Um, we tend to not fit them here. Um, it's, it takes all them complications away, but you can do that or you can fit an aero screen. Now there is a specific measurement from the seat height through the harness height through the steering wheel and here. And generally I think it's about 100 mil above here. If it comes above 100 mil, then it's required to have demiss facilities or wipers as well. So I would, gen, you know, general rule of thumb for us is this is how we run it, um, a standard through the IVA test. Okay, guys, that's not a definitive list of what needs to be done for IVA, but hopefully it's a good insight into some of the smaller little details maybe that you need to pick up on from the IVA M1 manual. Now, if you're very unsure, obviously speak to your manufacturer of your vehicle or ask if it's MK Sports Cars and the Indy, the manual will actually give you a, a very good guide into that anyway. But the VOSA guys also very, very helpful on the day in helping you pass your vehicle. Don't forget, as I said, the M1 manual from VOSA is downloadable. You can just search the government website and download the manual and that will give you a very good insight onto every dimension and requirement that's required for these M1 vehicles. Or if you want to know more about the MK Indy and the MK Sports Cars and what we do, obviously give us a call, drop us an email or message on Facebook or on the telephone number. Hopefully Neil will put that in the links below and then we'll be happy to help you. That's it guys. Like, share, you know where we are. <laughs>